Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Simon Says. And again, another couple of fantastic guests we have uh, to entertain us and inform us today. Um, probably uh, a lady who is just synonymous with the entertainment world in Melbourne and in Australia. Um, magnificent singer, has been on, on stage, has been on TV, has been in movies. Of course, has been in a band in a muso. The great and wondrous Wendy Stapleton. How are you, Wendy? Welcome. Hey, Simon. How are you? I'm, I'm great. All the better for seeing you. Fantastic. And of course, a man who, and we have a, we have a music theme this week, but a man who started as a, a footballer first, um, 228 games and 428 goals with the Melbourne Football Club, uh, debuted in 1997, is now uh, in the Tasmanian Hall of Fame, and, uh, but also as uh, a guitarist, singer, has been on TV too, and was a model for a while, and is big and digging. Again, the great and wondrous Russell Robinson. How are you? Hello, Simon. Hi, Wendy. How are we? Great. How are you? Oh, not bad. I'm, with, I'm, I'm dressed up for the occasion, Simon. I'm, I've got my beanie on and uh, my work clothes. You know, I, I haven't done a lot of manual labour since getting drafted, but we've all had to, what's the, the buzzword at the moment is we've all had to pivot. <laughs> and I've pivoted back to doing some building with a mate of mine. Well, just on that, you've got now, is that, is that, uh, that oh, I don't want to give anybody a free ad, Norwood, is it? You got anything to do with yeah. that? That's Norwood Constructions, um, Sir Jimmy, uh, mate of mine. Oh, uh, good. James Quinnert, and uh, he's, he's just got a lot of, well, it just seems that everybody's probably got a lot of cash now to... Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Well, well, people of a certain... Uh, I don't know. People they've got, that have, well, they've got nothing else to do. They're renovating the house. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, if they wait, they can't. Then maybe they had money to go on a holiday. They, they that's right. That is more so. Now, what are you doing in the car? Are you just keeping away from the work noise? Keeping away from all the noise. It's a bit windy up here. I'm up in the Yarra Junction, uh, Yarra, uh, the Yarra, at Yarra Junction at the moment on a farm. I can see some cattle in front of me. We've got a beautiful setting here. And I, I've been up here for the last two or three weeks. And it's, it's been quite nice, actually, to get out of the house away from the kids and the homeschooling. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people. A lot of people have new. Uh, I've said a lot of people have a newfound respect for teachers because they can. They have, they're having trouble dealing with three kids, and teachers normally deal with twenty to thirty in the one room. So there's a newfound <laughs> yeah. respect. Now, Wendy, where are you? you? You look like you're in a wonderful office at home. You've got a lot of. Yeah, uh, just at home in good old you know Mooney Ponds. Yeah, your local Essendon girl. Um, yeah, you well. Now, as a, as a muso, how has this affected you? Because your livelihood has been about being in front of people. Well, it's, there's no, li no livelihood. Uh, basically, it sort of completely stopped around about March. That was it. Um, look, we've, I've been doing, I've been very fortunate in as much as I've been doing a lot of um, shows, Zoom shows. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was saying that last night on YouTube, I did uh, John Foreman's Big Night In, which is run from the Melbourne Arts Centre, and that was fantastic because I sang a song with uh, the 60-piece Melbourne Pops Orchestra. Wow. And um, somehow they managed to uh, coordinate 60 musos and me and the conductor. And um, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send it to you. It was, it was amazing. I couldn't believe it when I looked at it last night. I thought, hey. I'm going to make sure I have a look at that, Wendy. That's fantastic. That sounds good. Now, just on that, so... So I've been doing a few things like that. Um, I've been running my rock choir... Uh, oh, of course, great. Yeah, uh, with the girls, of course, it's it's not serious. We just yeah, basically sort of like to see each other, you know. So doing that... An important, uh, important part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, really just doing the best you can. Um, but as you know, and Russell would know too, because we both used to work at the um, Arco Bar, um, that, uh, you know... There are no gigs. I mean, these people have, have been trying to do the best they can, you know, doing little Zoom things from the Arco Bar. Did you do that, Russ? Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't do the Zoom, the Zoom thing, but, um, uh, you know, Arco are just... And I know that this echoes the sentiment of all uh, cafe and restaurant owners everywhere, that they're just being... You know, unless they've been able to just do well with their takeaway meals and coffees, but it would just be a massive down time for all of those guys. But, you know, they, they, they've struggled through this and they just cannot wait to get back open to serve the people. And, and places like Arco Bar, where Wendy and I played, and 
uh, the, the music joints, they just live for that. Yeah. They live. I, I've got people messaging me, Wendy, you'd be the same. When are you back at a Huckabar? bar? I cannot wait to go out, just have a boogie and, 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 and get away from <laughs> the house, but just, you know, just release. And, it, and it's just such a massively important part of our lives. And I, I'm not sure through this that um, governments and leaders understand how important that yeah. side of things are because I feel like musos that I know have been sort of left, you know, wanting to be a little left in the lurch and then you'll be right. We'll just wait six, 12 months and uh, then you can get going again. <laughs> oh, look, it's, it's always fascinated me where someone's in a band and a, and a function place will go, look, you know, come and, or someone will do a function inside an upcoming band and go, look, you, you can come and play for free and we'll give you publicity. You'll get yeah. publicity. I always keep saying, well, I never say that to the caterer. They never say that to the person. You know, give us, give us, give us the food for free and we'll promote it, or give us your venue for free. But they always have this concept that music should be, you know, somehow you don't, you don't yeah. need money to make a living. Simon, that has been the story for not not just now. That's been the story forever. Um, you know, we've been asked to do functions at the Palladium at Crown. Now, how much do you think it would cost to even oh. hire, hire that room? And yet. They've asked the, the singers and the musos to do it for nothing. For publicity. I reckon it's, yeah, it's amazing anyway. Well, now, let, let's, let's make this a bit more positive. Let's not get too down. Yeah, no, 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 we're not going to be there. <laughs> now, Wendy, I'm now, Wendy I, I want to talk about, because if, if I'm, I try and do my research, find out, did you, were you actually on stage at nine years old? Did you start yes. at that age? Yes. So, how, did you, how did you get into that? Well, um, there, there were two dancing schools in Melbourne in the city. And they were actually sort of considered the, the places to go if you wanted to be in showbiz. Mind you, at nine, the chances are you've got a very sort of um, determined mother. Yeah. <laughs> and mum, mum, she was gorgeous, don't get me wrong, but she desperately wanted to be in showbiz. And, of course, the war broke out and that blew her career yes. out of the water. So she was determined that someone in the family was going to be in showbiz. So consequently, she took me to one of the dance schools. One was called May Dance. The other one was called Olive Wallace. And if you went there, sure enough, or provided you could cut it, uh, you were cast in theatre theatre shows. Back then, they only took children from those two, two schools. So I was very fortunate, and my first show was a, a Noel Coward play, and he came out from England for the opening, and so we all met the famous Noel Coward. And, yes. So I was nine, yeah. And it's just gone on and on from there. That's fantastic. <laughs> now, Russell, you're a, you're a Tasmanian boy. So you did you grow up in, uh, actually grown a little place on the north coast called Penguin? I did. And, and, played, yeah. for, I had my reach, and played for Bernie. Is that right? I, yeah, yeah, I played for Bernie. Started off, um, you know, a little town Penguin. And, and it's actually quite uh, strange that I'm in Yarra Junction right now because my mum grew up just not too far down the valley here. And, and, and she, she went to a debutante ball here in uh, Yarra Junction. I, and, I, and I'm working not too far away from it. But she had uh, she was a bit unlucky with her parents. They passed away early when she was young. And then her brother took her down to Tassie to live with him. And she met my dad. And, and then, obviously, uh, we, we, we grew up in a little 2,000-strong town uh, on the coast, uh, northwest coast of Tasmania. Beautiful little spot. I'd love yeah, to be I've been, I've been I've been to Penguin. I've been to Bernie. Uh, lovely, yeah. lovely, lovely part of the world. The coast on there, I, it's one of the underrated things because it probably hasn't got the population like some of the coasts along Victoria. It's mm. just beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, place. yeah. And, and I tell you, they do appreciate the music when you bring it to their, to their state. So, um, you know, the Victorians coming down and playing for them, they love it because it's something a little bit different. So, but yeah, look, I, I played for, for Bernie though, because I was advised by my mentor, Chris Fagan, who is now the uh, coach of the Brisbane Lions and doing yes, very, very well doing at that. Very well. Um, he, he told me, look, you know, you're going to have to go and play for Bernie if you want to make the state side, because he was our state coach. Um, mm. Peter German was coaching the uh, Bernie Dockers at the time. The oh, ex right, yes. Ex-North Melbourne. You would have uh, saddled up against him a few times, Simon. Yeah, he talked uh, to, he's actually talked to me about one time I stood in his hand and I keep completely, I can't remember it. I've apologised to him. I said, if I did that, I'm fine. <laughs> it was a, diff a different time, he said. Yeah, well, it would have been easy to do. You only came up to your hips because you're so big. <laughs> um, and, and, yeah, I got the good coaching from him and, and look, it was a wonderful little time of my life i suppose from the age of what you know 
16 through to uh, 18, getting drafted and heading over to, to the Big Smoke here in Victoria. It's fantastic. And Wendy, starting off at nine on stage, then you just, you just like you're on the Tarek show, if I remember, one of my yep. favourite shows. And you were just, you've always been, always been an entertainer. Well, yes, yes. Um, it just followed on, you know, the, the television was another part, um, television was relatively newish. Yeah. And uh, they had, the kids' shows um, had kids on the show as well, not just adults. They had the kids, the dancers and the singers. And so uh, that was King Corky. <laughs> you, you Russell, go. you weren't born, so no, just, <laughs> just, pretend, right? just just look interested. Um, you know who was fabulous? Um, even back then, Ernie Carroll, uh, who was, of course, Aussie Ostrich on... Yes. Hey, hey, it's Saturday. But back then, when we were little kids, he played a character called Professor Ratbaggy. I do remember uh, that too. So, yeah, it was, it was wonderful growing up doing all that stuff. That's fantastic. And now, um, you also, like, you've done, well, you had, oh, like, you were in lots of bands, I know. You're a local Essendon girl, which is great, and I still hope you follow Essendon. But, like, you had Wendy, Wendy, the Wendy Stubblin band, and then the big one, of course, was Wendy and the Rockets. How did that come about? Well, in actual fact, I'd, I'd been playing in bands, and I must correct you, I'm El actually a Melbourne girl. Huh? <laughs> by uh, Simon, that's by default. We, no, that's, that's why we got Russell on, mate. That's right. <laughs> by default, but um, the family's a bit of a mishmash. One brother's Essendon, Bill, my brother's Carlton, as you know. Yes. And um, the reason I was with Melbourne, I'm just di digressing here, but was because Peter Sullivan, my musician friend, uh, we did all the functions for the Melbourne uh, Football Club. And so eventually I just spent so much time with, it was beautiful, you know, Jimmy Steins and um, Gary Lyon and all those guys. We spent so much of our time at their social functions that I ended up being in the, in the tridents and all that sort of stuff. So it is a bit of a sort of mishmash uh, life that I live with the football uh, fraternity, but... Wendy and the Rockets, yes, sorry, I'll get back on to No, it. that's right, that's good. I, I, I like hearing the background, that's great. Yeah, well, it's, it's a real mish, you know, <laughs> but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, Wendy and the Rockets, I, I've been in bands, you know, since very young, 15, 16. Of course, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to be 18. Especially in, pu especially in pubs, of course. Yeah, yeah. especially in pubs. <laughs> um, but uh, eventually, uh, David Briggs from Little River Band, who was a friend of mine, uh, I did some demos with him and um, he uh, got me a, a deal with Michael Gadinsky with Mushroom Records. And um, I was signed as a solo artist, but it's really hard to do gigs. Yeah. Solo artists. So um, I formed the Rockets and, um, gee, what a, what a lot of fun we had. That's fantastic. Now, Russell, you're, you're known firstly as a, as a footballer and, of course, you know, is it true actually got sort of noticed be through almost footy legends on TV. Somebody saw one of those great big high marks and said, we better go and have a look at this bloke. Yeah. And look, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a good story for, for a parent, really. The, the fact that I got drafted from the footy show um, and the almost footy legends segment, it's, it's great that that was available to me because it did get me noticed. But really, it sort of goes back further than that. And that was... Um, uh, my father, who is a school teacher, secondary school teacher, um, working in uh, the woodwork um, department for metalwork, you know, tech design, all that sort of stuff. Um, he um, he would come home. I had three sisters, so he was pretty keen to have a kick of the footy with me. <laughs> Get away from all the, uh, the the female talk inside, which is great. But we we would go out the front every single. I mean, first thing he said when we got home was when he got home from school. We'd he get home pretty early, being a teacher. You know, come boy, it's going to have a kick. So we'd go out the front, and and I think he noticed early days that I had a decent set of uh, hands, but I wasn't tall enough, and I'm still not <laughs> to get up high enough um, to to mark the the ball with my schoolmates that would be there with me, or or mates and cousins and whatnot. So Dad's suggestion was, why don't you step off them? And you'll love this, Simon, because you did a bit of this, was to step off and just run up and use their hips for a little bit of leverage to get above the hand. <laughs> yes. Uh, that, that works for a little while with your mates. And they stop coming around pretty Yeah, they don't because they get fucking hurt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's got me again. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so Dad, being an engineer type, um, he, he, 
got a 4 by 2 and a bit of a rubber tube and the inner tube from my bike, cut that in half and then got one of mum's um, stockings and put a footy inside the leg of the stocking and then he tied and rigged it all up to the 4 by 2 off the shed. And you, and you think about um, Don Bradman and his, um, you know, cricket stump off the corrugated yeah. iron. That's right, yeah. Um, water tank for the kiddies out there listening that don't know that you should Google that. That was his, he just did that every day over and over trying yes. to get his eye in and the ball would go anywhere and he did it and becomes the best cricketer of all time. Well, that was my Don Bradman type training with that ball was there. I was just hour upon hour just out there grabbing the ball, bring it to the ground, let it go. And it would just bounce rebound back to a position above my head. And, and I just got better and better at it. Mates and I would, would stand underneath it, would take hangers on each other, bring yeah. the ball to the ground, you know, Gappa and Jezza and all that stuff. And then, um, you know, Dad got a, a rock bag, um, got one of those made up. He'd throw the ball up in the air and he'd stand underneath it. He, he worked on this with me over and over and over to get me um, just really comfortable being in the air and taking the ball high. I'd jump on the trampoline, he'd kick the ball and I'd have to jump off the trampoline and catch it and land on the grass and roll. And So I, I, after about five or six years of doing this, um, I ended up making the, the state team under Chris Fagan and, and I've taken a couple of marks that year that, you know, that were, were pretty good. So they were high. They were really high. And, and it ended up winning the Almost Wood Legend and the, and the other mark came third. So Melbourne, in their wisdom, they sent down a scout. I must have said the right things. And then I go on to get drafted. And, and it's all because my old man took the time to, you know, understand and, and, and facilitate. He was a great facilitator. And that's, what, that's all you need, really, in life, is somebody that is is going to give you some information that's going to help. Now, I yeah. say to kids all the time, you know, you may be unlucky and you don't have that great facilitator like I had my dad who would, who would take the time and notice. But you've got to go and find one. You've got to find your own uh, mentors. Get off your ass. Don't wallow in pity. Find someone that can teach you something. Because most, I mean, if anyone came up to me, and you guys would be the same, if they asked you a question, when do you, someone come and say, can you teach me to sing? Oh, my God, yes, you'd teach them in a second, wouldn't you? You just want to impart the knowledge. Yeah, so yeah. I, was, I was lucky. My mum was a good facilitator more cause she, for me because she would just wash the, the mud off me before I went inside and had a shower. There was no, <laughs> no, no, it was never, oh, you're dirty, don't come inside. So just yeah. get the mud off first, go and have a shower. You know, like those little things, just some encouragement. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Wendy, Wendy, for you, like that's, it's really interesting to hear that from Russell. What about you as far as mentors or people helping with your career and your direction? Well, as, as I said, it started with mum. Uh, her so passionately wanting to be in showbiz. Uh, so that rubbed off. Uh, my poor brothers actually had to do tapping until I was two years old. Uh, Bill, as you know, Bill's uh, seven uh, years older and Robbie's uh, six years older and the poor guys, <laughs> they're going to kill me for telling you this. Ah, please, uh, tell us. They had to tap until I was old enough to go and do it. <laughs> and then they, could do, then they could play footy up at Essendon. Yeah, right. Uh, so, <laughs> Oh, boy. Um, but mum and uh, then, of course, uh, going back to being at, um, at the dancing school so young, uh, there were people there that were, oh, we called them the big girls. Well, she was eight years old and nine years old. It was Patty McGrath, Bert Newton's Patty. Oh, yeah, right. Denise Drysdale. Um, right. And so a lot of those girls at the dancing school, um, being, a, a, being a lot older, were already um, forging their way in the theatre and in television, and uh, they would they would help us young ones along. So mm -hmm. you know you 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 were helped along the way, the whole journey. So it wasn't necessarily just a dancing school. We had singing lessons. Uh, so everything was sort of people were there to help you. You know, that's great. Now, now, uh, Russell, I want to talk about your music too. But firstly. Almost Footy Legends gets you there. You're regularly in, in uh, Mark of the Week, but I don't think you ever actually won Mark of the Year. Is that correct? No, I never, never won Mark of the Year. Well, I can, I can, I'm sure I've said about half a dozen, a dozen of yours that you put it right up the top, but never got Mark of the Year. <laughs> no, and it, look, it, 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 you know, no one really sort of remembers year by year who won Mark of the Year, but, but I um, am renowned for being a high flyer. And I think she said to me one day, if there was a... If there was a, I love Sheeds. It just, he just comes up with pearls. I saw him. Yeah, 
I saw him and uh, and Kevin Bartlett up on stage at the uh, Mooney Valley uh, last year. My God, it was it was a laugh a second with those two. Oh yeah, those two together. Yeah, that yeah. yeah. yeah, was <laughs> unbelievable. But he said to me, you know, if there was an award for the most consistent, you know, you would get it. This was before Jeremy Howe. I, I think I'm second to him in terms of the most marks of the week in the modern era. So yeah, fantastic. Uh, for me, it wasn't about taking a mark, Simon. It was more about um, being able to kick a goal. Yes. I, just, and, I love the goal. I just wanted and, to get it. And you were pretty, and you were pre- I mean, 428, you were pretty good at it. Well, I knew where the goals were, and, and I didn't like going too far down the other end of the <laughs> ground. I got a, got a little bit lost. I lost contact with the goalpost. I didn't like that. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I, was, I was a good um, goal kicker. You know, I averaged me just under two and, and being a small little half forward flanker who's not necessarily they were kicking the neater. So I'm kicking yeah. the neater all the time. They weren't kicking at me. <laughs> <laughs> and you just happen to be there. You just have to fly in from the side. Jump on Fantastic. The <laughs> now, um, now, Wendy, a whole lot of stuff you've done and of course, you know, the musical theatre background, but you had, um, you had great success with the Dusty Springfield story. And I, I, I actually remember seeing you do that. I remember you did a, a, um, a New Year's Eve concert and uh, you, did, you did your own stuff and a bit of stuff, but then you did a section of the Dusty Springfield story. Fantastic. It was great. Now, how did you get into that? Well, I was actually um, in a, a rock musical called Bad Boy Johnny. So it was all of the guys from the Rocky Horror Show, Daniel Abenieri, Steve Bastoni, and they all came down from Sydney. And uh, Russell Crowe was in it. Uh, as well, he was young young boy in that show, and uh, that was on at the Comedy Theatre. Um, it didn't go it, in in Australia. It didn't go further than the comedy, but it did overseas. And the one of the directors thought that from on the stage I looked a lot like Dusty. Um, I'd never thought about it, yeah. but it, I did, uh, and I could sound if I concentrated. I could sound like dusty so they offered me the role of this new show that they were doing and um i took it with both hands and said thank you very much and uh, uh it was fabulous i mean it was years and years and years of dusty oh look it was fantastic and of course you had to have the big hair so i don't think it was your hair if i can remember that it was very very big what <laughs> was shit you know what I've, I've got a cupboard up here um, it's too scary it's too scary to show anybody seriously it's full of these wigs and sometimes you'd be going to a gig and I'd have them all in the back of the car, just these heads on pieces of plastic, you know, and you'd see drivers going past going, ah, <laughs> there were heads like this. Um, yeah, big, big hair, big hair. That is fantastic. Yeah. Now, now, Russell, uh, when did you first pick up a guitar? Uh, it would have been, I remember watching Hey Hey It's Saturday as a young fella. And because that's what we all did back yeah. then, we watched Hey Hey. And um, I remember seeing um, Nathan Cavalieri, Cavalieri come on um, uh, one, uh, one evening, and he's like 12 or 11. Yeah, and that's right. Up. Yes, the early um, days. That's amazing, right. Amazing blues and rock with the band and with Red and the guys. And, and, and I thought to myself, God, that's cool. You know, yeah. that is so cool. Yeah. But my old man had already got started me on the piano before this. Um, about what age was that when you're on the piano? I reckon I was probably about eight, yeah, right, eight, nine, ten year old. By the time I decided to give that away, um, that that I didn't. It wasn't so much that I didn't like playing piano. I liked playing piano at home with dad, but but um, <laughs> didn't like my teacher that much. She was. <laughs> It's just a bit on the old side, that's all. Oh, you realised you wouldn't get the chicks playing the piano. That's what happened. That's 100%. And, and you, can, you, can carry, you can carry guitar in the back of the car, but it's very hard to have a piano in the back of the car. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, I, I didn't really do much with music for a long time, and then I came over to Melbourne, and in the downtime, I just went and bought myself a guitar and, and, and slowly just sort of taught, taught myself how to play that. And, and uh, you know, it goes on from there. I did a couple of things on the footy show and, and then Channel 10 Air Takes Two. I did that with, with Kate. Um, well, hang on, just not just Kate, like Takes Two, that was with Kate Sobrano. That's, you know, I mean, let's, yeah. drop, the na- let's drop the name properly, just our uh, Kate. Let's drop a proper name, Kate well, Sobrano. We're, we're first name basis, you know. But, <laughs> but and, and look, I've been so lucky since then, you know, well, I hooked in with Phil Sobrano, her yeah. uh, brother, and he's just phenomenal, you know. Like, Kate's 
a freak of nature. We know that. And, mm. and um, But Phil's creativity and, and ability to play guitar and, and just beyond music too, his creativity is really, really amazing. And when do you know? Because you would have hung around him a lot over yeah. the years. Yeah. It's just a laugh a minute, isn't he? He's just... Oh, he's- He's, he's a live wire, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I love him. And, and, and we play gigs all over Victoria and even Australia. And, um, and I've been able to hook in with lots of great musicians ever since. So for me, it's been a real grind over the last um, 10 years since that show. And, and all I ever wanted to do was really play somewhere and have people enjoy some music. It wasn't about, you know, writing a, 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 the next great single or anything like that. It's just so much fun. You know, everyone has fun when they're out watching and listening to live music. Melbourne's yes. the best at it, and it just sucks that we can't do it at the moment. Yeah. And just on that, so you had you had it takes two, and then and Wendy, you had I think at one stage two up with Glenn Sherrick. That's another big name to just we we'll just drop another big name there. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> How was that one? How did that come about? Actually, in between Dusties, uh, we we'd done Australia, toured around Australia, and. We were taking a year of the Dusty shows. Uh, We were going to England and that didn't happen for some reason. So Glenn Shorrick asked me if I'd do a a theatre production with him. The idea being uh, duos from all around the world, you know, every famous duo you could think of. And um, uh, I don't know whether you, or you probably do, Simon, but um, Glenn Shorrick's an amazing comedian. He's, He's... He's really funny. And it, was so, just, it was just busy making money out of music, that's right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it was a really funny show. So we did that for 12 months. Fantastic. Um, that was great fun. But you haven't, you haven't told us about your music. Oh, well, yeah, well, it's, not oh, about, it's not about me, but let's make it about me. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, just, you know, like uh, Wendy... Wendy's, uh, and it's uh, really interesting uh, that, you're, you know, we got you to speak, Wendy, because uh, your partner, Paul, Paul Norton, you, and my wife, Mary, was in your choir, That's how, and she can sing, and she doesn't like me talking about it, but she can sing, and she can, she actually picks harmony. Like, I can learn harmony. And, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm an, a sort of singer, but I play guitar more, you know, more than I'm a singer. I've just never had proper lessons, et cetera, and a bit of fun, but it's good when you sing in a group. But So, Mary... Um, yeah, Mary. But friends and you know love being in the choir with you and that was just great fun and you know we know some of the girls can't sing and they try really hard others are there just for fun and it's the group together is fantastic and you talk mary into being in the um being in the in the choir which is great and then you turned around to me and said well well if mary's in the choir you've got to do weekend warriors with paul norton you know and and i had a couple of friends and, and we i can remember this and this was ages ago and and i said oh yeah but there's me and two mates and We've got to be together. So we turn up at the pub, Hardyman's pub, upstairs. You do that. You do the, um, do the just the you know sort of scratching around and have a go. And then we started and, and we put the you know get, get band together. It was you know half an hour. Paul and Paul actually is a really good producer on that. He, I know he produces a whole lot of music for different people. And then we actually got us. He produced us. And I think on the you do about half an hour, seven songs, six yeah. seven songs. Yeah. And we half and I reckon that day we were the most produced. We were the most were we the best? I'm not sure, but we were the yeah. tight, tightest band because we'd actually worked together. And then we finished that and we call ourselves, I think we all put coloured T-shirts on and call ourselves the wrinkles because it was late, you know. So rather than the wiggles, we call ourselves the wrinkles and said we do age-appropriate music. And we finished that. It was great. And then one of the blokes turned around and said, do you want to do more of this? And we sort of went, yeah. And 10 years up, well, we were going to have our 10-year reunion this year. We were going to have a big gig for our 10-year yeah. anniversary. And of course, we're going to make that next year. So I, under, I understand all that about, um, and, you know, we do covers, but it was really enjoyable. I think Wendy and Paul were, were happy that one of their bands actually took it up and kept going. Because, you know, we can warrant, some people just want to, um, they just want to sing that song in front of a crowd. And, you know, um, as you said, Russell, like just that enjoyment in a crowd. Some so, people want to say, I just need to sing this song in public to make myself feel good, which is fantastic. So, and... Yeah. And we just sort of went, well, we're going to have more fun with it. And so we, we're still going, hopefully, after the end of this. I loved, mm. I loved the way I went to see you guys at the Ascot Vale when Better Late Than Never first started. And the two girls, your wife, Mary, and Kenny. Gail, Bob, yeah, Gail, yeah. Gail. And they were, uh, Russell, they were doing BVs on the side of the stage, like just sort of over to the side a bit. And during the break, yeah. I, said, uh. I said, just moving a little bit more toward, 
toward the center. Put them in the middle. Every time, every time they sort of do a new song, just move closer to the center. Yeah. <laughs> and by yeah. doing the and now up, up on stage, very good, Wendy. Up on stage, they're placed right in the middle. And, and, to be, and to be fair, I'd rather be looking at two good-looking ladies than these ugly old faces we've got. So that's fine. That's good. <laughs> the trouble is every now and then, especially at a pub, every now and then there's someone who's getting a little bit too close. You know, they, they, you know people love the person on stage. I'm sure, sure Russell, you know, being a model at times, people look at you on stage and they fall in the singer. Wendy, they've fallen in love with Wendy for years and years. They're not going to fall uh, in love with me, but they like the girls. <laughs> there is a bit of that that goes on. There's the stares that happen and, and, you know, there's trying to make a connection. But, you know, it's all in the that's, – that's the emotion of music and that's the, the – even if it is just a cover song that you're playing that's been heard a million times before. But I, what I love about playing with Phil and, and – you know, the people that I've selected, I suppose, since then, the ones that I enjoy playing with are the ones that make this gig uh, a party because they understand that not everyone gets out that often. You know, we, we're stuck at home or we've got lots of work, but um, you know what? We're going to make, we're going to get out tonight and, and, and we make this gig the best gig for them tonight. And Phil's really great at that. And I really, really do appreciate playing with him and, yeah, I'll watch you, Sean, when I've done a couple of things and you, you're on, and I'll, you want to come up and play. Yeah, no, it's, mate, addictive. Mate. it's addictive. It's but, I, but I mean, I, you know, and I make sure, as you know, Matt, you've done a couple of solo gigs at the AFL, etc. I make sure I come and say hello, but I make sure, and there's everybody, everybody's listening, and but I'm trying to listen to you too, and make sure, I, and I, you know, I've said before, I'd love to go and do a song with, you know, I'd love to do a song with anybody, of course, but, it, but I love, I love that, that thing, like, you know, Wendy and Paul will be playing somewhere and if you know someone, Wendy, you're, you're like, come and have a sing with us or come and come up. You know, this is a party. This is fun. And I, I, obviously, you know, you don't want some drunk idiot coming up with you or anything like that. But, that, but music's collaborative and it's and it's fun and, and it's supposed to be fun. And, and what you'll notice is, and the best gigs that I've, I've done is, is where people will be... <laughs> We'll, we'll have a friend that oh she can she's a great singer she was on the voice or she was you know and can you get her up to have a sing and then and then we do and the crowd love it they're like yeah. that's great you had a crack it's brilliant you know that's great now just just on that talking about that because you mentioned um Wendy you and Paul and every now and then it's Michael Cristiano I think and sometimes it's yeah. Jerry Hale you do a lot of that trio stuff so yeah. You've got um, a two guitars or one guitar and a fiddle or one other instrument, and and um, we've seen lots of that. It's just fantastic. You must love doing that because it's just it's an e like you know a trio is an easy thing to carry around rather than have a full band or a sixty piece orchestra, which you'd love to play in front of. But you can get up and you can do really good stuff in a in a confined space. Yeah, well, it's an it's another it's another angle because that uh, it's it's actually a lie i mean it's acoustic it's yeah, the yeah. three the three or the no all i do is play tambourine very you well it, but you do a very good you do a very good job <laughs> but um with jerry and with michael uh, the boys are playing whereas um i've done my fair share of uh, trios like years ago with bobby v bobby valentine and um keith mckay and we used tracks and that's fun as well because yeah. uh you a, a lot of the time people do want to really party and you need that track to sort of push it along being a duo or a three piece yeah. so um there's there's lovely different sort of little ways of doing uh, your trios or your duos some with backtracks some uh, you know acoustically i mean it limits a lot of the stuff that you can do but, but um, you but you do it well. I mean, I, I know I've been to a few of your, you know, a few of your, say, Sunday afternoon pub gigs. Um, and I, I looked at your website, and there's still some listed there, whether they'll, whether they'll happen or not. <laughs> you don't know. There's there's addresses there, but you don't know. But just um, bowls. Yeah, no, we've been, <laughs> been there, done that. And down at uh, down in South Melbourne, what's the pub down in South Melbourne? The um, uh, the Rising Sun. The Rising Sun. I think you've done that too. That's great. That's great. That's great. Now, now, Russell, what like now? What music are you listening to? I mean, and I like I, I listen to a whole range, and I'm you know very e eclectic um, listener. But and as yeah. you say, there's party music, there's quiet music, there's music in the background. But what's the music you're sort of listening to now? Oh, I'm a bit this. Look, my music taste has. I'm a boy of the uh, '90s. Unfortunately, you know, there's not a lot of great <laughs> great music coming from from the '90s, unless it was your sort of your grunge, you know, yeah. Pearl Jam, 
um, Nirvana, those, those sorts of bands. So I guess I, because I came up in that era, I'm sort of stuck to it, really. I, I appreciate um, the 80s and the 70s the most, and I think we all do because we understand that that's where, you know, there's the best stuff, the rock and roll, and, you know, obviously the 60s as well. That's that's where it was at, and it's kind of hard. It was all, it's all written. It's all done. All the melodies have been found, you know, and, 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 and it's so that I'm, I'm, you know, I grew up listening to um, uh, Daddy Cool. Um, yeah, Daddy Cool. Eagle Rock was my favourite song for a long time, and you know all those all those songs on that album, and because they were just Dad's Dad's records there at home. So I had a good grounding in the old music with his old records. But what I listened to, is, as long as it's a band, I'm happy. I don't like I don't like um, something that's um, um, you know. Techno, techno or, or yeah, made on a computer. I don't like any of that stuff. The young kids stuff, I don't really like. But I do appreciate. The, I can hear the drums, I can hear the guitar, and I can hear yeah. the band there. So you know the Killers and and um, you know John Mayer and those sorts of guys. I I, I really like that kind of music. But yeah. it, but my favourite band is um, you know well uh, my favourite Australian band is Boyne Bear. Um, oh yes, yeah. Good. Um, actually, and as an old bloke, actually, to know who they are, you got to actually listen yeah, to them. That's not bad yeah. for a fella. <laughs> actually, yeah, that's not bad, mate. With all those greats, uh, what, what, what? I actually really enjoyed watching. I mean, what a trio, uh, Wendy, Wendy, and um, Paul and and Michael. My uh, God, Michael's just... guitar. Michael's got a guitar. I, I think it's the one he's got. This um, Gibson, um, and it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, it's actually tailor made Gibson. It's it's somewhere like you know, it's a special made Gibson. I've said to him, it's like, if you ever die, I'm gonna pitch your guitar. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's just an absolute freak. And and you guys, Wendy, are doing this well, I don't, you know, it's folky, it's it's earthy, it's really great, and it's and it's a good to have a dance to as well, and there's covers in there and, and it's absolutely brilliant. And that was I think that was at Arco Bar last time I heard you guys. But you know, Michael Michael does this thing. I was at a um an event for I think it was it was in Geelong and it was for all the graduates of the university down there. Yeah. Michael runs that, and yeah, he does, that. Yeah. And he gets up there and he just plays on that um, nylon string, that hollow bodied thing, that that thing that's just the outline. That's not I don't know what. Yeah, it's one called. of those. Yeah, one of those ones. Yeah. Oh, and he played he played somewhere over the rainbow and and all these other just no singing, just playing and fiddling yeah. away. And I. <laughs> I reckon I was just mouth wide open, just glued. Yeah. To, um, this guy, that is unbelievable. You guys do not appreciate how good this guy is. <laughs> well, see, he was he was um, classically trained uh, from yes. a little boy. Uh, so not just the chords and all that sort of stuff, which, you know, when you pick up a guitar and you start playing, yeah. he actually did the whole shebang. So yeah. Michael was actually... Uh, it sounds ridiculous, but he was conducting at some stupid age, like 15. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so it's a whole different ball game, you know. It's yeah. a, it's. And, my, and, and, and you talked about it a bit too, Simon, and, and we don't want to be negative because people do see music as being fun, so they, re, they relate music to being fun. But you look at Michael and, and Wendy, we've heard your story, but these guys have been, and it's not me because I'm a little bit different, but these guys have been playing music since... They were wee tackers, and yeah. there's hour upon hour upon hour upon hour of picking up the guitar, and that's I just use that as the one instrument, yeah. mm. and and practicing. Right now, I challenge anyone out there: that, Have you done anything like that? You know, since a little kid. So they they put the hours in. You've got a guitar at your house. You look at it. You play one chord, and then you put it down again because you can't be bothered with it. But these guys love it, and they learnt it, and they've got uh, millions of hours of a degree there. Mm. to make your event amazing. And it doesn't just happen. You don't just get up there and play. This is a lot that goes into that sort of stuff. So we, I think people kind of understand, but they kind of don't as well. No, they can't. Because it's, it's because it seems so natural. Mm. It seems easy to people. But I can remember I did, you know, I do, I do um, well, I did before COVID, a lot of group sessions as far as development with people. And I remember once, yeah. you know, I said, look, we're going to write a song. Just this thing we did with a group on a, on a conference, you know, very simple, we're going to write a song each and just three chords and have a bit of fun with it. And I said, now there's 25 people. And I said, now somebody else must be able to play guitar here. And not one person could. And I said, you yeah. forget, you forget that sometimes there's yeah. out of the whole lot of people. Now I know more people are playing instruments, but a whole lot of people in the audience 
not a lot of them can play the music, so they probably don't understand the intricacy. And like you know, me, I'm you know, I'm I'm all right, but you talk about you know, musos who've done that for their life. They just it's just ingrained, and and they're doing music every day, and they're thinking and creating and developing and playing, yeah. and it's just it is just fabulous, and it's something that um, I think you really have to have an appreciation of. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Russell, the point you're making is that um, I guess because of technology as well, um, in the last, say, 10, 20 years, uh, yeah. a lot of people have thought that they can they can make music because you just push that button and then da 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 However, there's much more to it than <laughs> that. And, and as you were saying, you've got to put the work in. Yeah. I, I reckon, that, but that's a really good point. You know, if you if you want to be, you know, like it's interesting um, that where we started from, Russell, when you talk about the time your dad had you doing lots of footy. Now it was enjoyable, but you put a lot of time in first. Yeah. Wendy started at nine. There's time. Any, if you want to be successful in anything, I know there's an old measurement of ten thousand hours, and there's two sides to it. It's, it's not actually ten thousand hours, but it's equivalent of that. You put that into anything, you probably become good at it. Now yeah. you think about the hours you put into it over your career in music or in sport. You just do. You actually have to do all that. There's very few who make it just because of their talent. It's yeah. the hours that go into it with it. You know, you've got to do the work. I think that's the famous story that uh, Jerry Seinfeld was asked to go back and do a talk at his university or college or whatever it was over there in the, st uh, in the States. And he didn't want to do it. And they offered him all sorts of money, which he wasn't interested in. He finally relented and he went to this um, auditorium where the whole school was there to see Jerry Seinfeld is going to talk to us all. And all he did is he walked out on stage. He said, you want my lesson for life? And I, we had butcher paper set up there and he just wrote three words, do the work. Yeah. And then walked off. And <laughs> asked, yeah, and that's brilliant. And it's true. You know, and you ask any um, musician, guitarist, I saw a thing online and they were asking guitarists, how do you become a great guitarist? Uh, three words, and most of them just said practice, practice, practice. Right, yeah, but do the work. Yeah, that's right. Do, practice, do practice. The work. No. I, I tell you, it's really interesting. I like Edge. You know, you talk about different. I like Edge here, and I like the story about when he first he did his first big single to hit in a um, in Australia, and he was on one of those X Factor, one of those shows, and they got him up. And they said, "Oh, you've been fantastic. You're an overnight success." And he said, "Well, actually, I'm not." He said, "I've been doing this for ten years. You've just yeah. noticed me now." Yeah. And he's doing three. He's doing three hundred gigs a year. Yeah. So he was doing the work, doing the work, doing the grounding, and then he got found, which is always, as you say, you got found in your football. Not everybody gets found necessarily, but no, that, that's, did the that's, work. What, that's what NXS did. They were the hardest working band in Australia. They gigged every single night. You know, they 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 learnt the craft. And and look, that, that's that's bands, and, and they forget about you know we're forgetting about singers like like Wendy here. I mean, that's a natural born talent that she's had to work at as well. You know, that's a muscle that needs to be strengthened every single day. Yeah. And a lot of musicians, I think a lot of singers, it's nice for me to be able to stand up there and hide behind a guitar, but Wendy has got to stand up there and Kate's got to stand up there and just exposed sing. And, and, and every single day she's making sure that this is, this is working and, and yeah. getting stronger. And, and I'm sure you give that advice to all your, your kids that you teach, Wendy, that you've got to do the work with singing as well. Melodies are in the scale. They're in the scale there somewhere. You've got to find those melodies. You've got to be able to hit those notes. Yeah. And it just doesn't happen. You just don't walk onto a stage on the X Factor and you become a superstar. <laughs> no, it's that's fun. great. It's a... It's a as you said, it, it actually, uh, a lot of people are freaked out when you say, you know, it, it's a muscle. Yeah. Like it's some secret little, your voice box is something else, but you're right, it's a muscle. And yeah. you also need muscle memory. Yeah. Uh, for example, when I was doing Dusty, because I, the songs were sort of husky and softer, and I was so used to being in I'm a rock band. You know, trying to get over that bloody guitarist. <laughs> no bloody guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, when I was doing the theatre run of Dusty, one night after the Saturday night show, uh, the Peter Sullivan big band were playing for the opening of a big musical. I think it might have been Phantom or, or something like that. Big after party at the Melbourne Town Hall. And they said, come down after Dusty and jump up and do just one song, one song. So, you know, Silly here gets excited, has a few drinks, jumps up on the stage with the big band, and I sang um, River Deep, Mountain High, and I really yeah. went for it. Yeah. Really went for it, you know. Yeah. And the next day we had a Sunday late afternoon 
show for the Dusty. Yeah. Could yeah. you? Yeah. Wow, yeah. And see, people forget it. It's an yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd blown it. I'd wow. It's all, you know. Yeah, it happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially if you've had a couple of drinks. Yeah, you yeah, do. Let's go. <laughs> oh, no, not me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, uh, I look. I think we. I, I think I'll have to stop it there. We've been going about. We're trying to go about forty, forty-five minutes. So I think we've reached that very, very. Talk quickly. all day, Simon. We can talk all day about music. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you could. We could go on. It's, it's fantastic. That's um. It's really interesting. But I, normally, I try and ask a few questions about success and and the struggle, etc. You've already you've already spoken about that. You've talked about that. Um. Uh, what's the future hold? Do we know? Oh God, I don't know. Um. You know, I I. I I feel confident about, you know, the country opening up around Christmas time. I'm, I'm only confident because I'm hopeful. I feel very sorry for a lot of Victorians. 99.9% of us have been doing the right thing and, and doing, as we're told, like good little boys and girls. Um, and there, there has been some people that have made some bad decisions, probably at the top end, that have made us suffer. We have suffered and we deserve to see our families. And what worries me is there's a lot of people out there that are suffering silently. Yeah. Uh, we don't know their stories and we, we never will, our fellow Australians. And, and I think it's probably the, ne the future needs to be a little bit about care and a little bit about looking after one another. And, 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 the, and I think take this time right now to, to figure out how you're going to attack and approach your next year. Learn something from this last 10, 11 months of just absolute, it's been shit. It's right. been awful. And there's nothing exciting about, you know, a lot of work, for a lot of people, is it's really going to be a bit of a struggle. So my message to people out there is, you know, because of the COVID thing, we need to love each other a little bit more. We need yeah. to be a little bit softer with each other and understanding of each other. In terms of, you know, building yourself up to something new, you know, and what we've spoken about, my final messages are, you know, you, yes, you do have to do the work. You have to find mentors in people and you have to put a smile on your face and appreciate people for their, their talents and their abilities and, 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 and rejoice in that. That's one of my greatest talents is that I can sit there and watch Wendy sing and just be blown away by her talent yeah. and tell her and, and, and feel great in that moment. There are a lot of people that feel the other way, you know what I mean? So, you know, try your best to, to, to be a little bit more like that, I think, in the future. This has just been so really, really horrible this last 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that um, we've also got to realise, especially with kids, uh, as you said, it's been wonderful to be able to, <laughs> not wonderful to have them at home with you, but yeah. to have all of that love and time, time that they didn't normally have. And, you know, we've got to remember that kids are very resilient. Yeah, and yeah. the thing is that we won't forget this, but no. a lot of young people we've got to encourage them to just get on with it. Yeah. It may not be the same world, but yeah. it's still got to go ahead. Yeah, that's well, right. Look, we've got to be positive for well, them. Fantastic, Wendy and Russell. What a great way to finish off this. Uh, look, thank you very much for your time. Love your insight. Love the music talk. We could do that. And at some stage, at some stage, we're going to try and get the three of us together and play. Oh, yeah. Even in the backyard, yeah. just do something. Yeah. Have, a, have a bit of a get-together. Um, that's fantastic. Wendy, uh, always love your work and your, your voice has got, I keep saying, it's like a beautiful red. It's got better and better over the years. Oh, and yeah. Russell, I've just I've always been fascinated. You know, they say to me, a, a footballer can play guitar. Yeah, yeah. Well, a bloke like you, mate, and get up at that, who can play footy like that and then come out and have a music career too along the way after is fantastic. So, yeah. Wendy, Wendy and, and Russell, thank you very much. Thanks, brother. See you, Wendy. See ya. Bye. Hey boys. Yeah.